Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Kahn Report wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when we know you have a choice. So I appreciate any time you choose this show. I'm going to be continuing doing multiple shows every week throughout the offseason. Only going to slow down when it gets into July, right before camp. Before then, it's going to be multiple shows every week. So it would be a variety of content from offseason priorities to roundtable discussions to bringing on former players, some current players, and then analysts throughout the league. So just know that's going to keep coming, and hopefully you keep tuning in. And I, again, always appreciate it. Today, it's Friday, so it means keys and predictions, right? Well, no, I'm not doing predictions for this game. Here's my prediction. Dallas is going to win. So there you go. And if Washington wins, more power to them, but Dallas is going to win. And in fact, you know, I know for the draft Knicks out there, and I'm with you on this one, the better thing for Washington is to lose. Improve that draft stock, because if you want to get a quarterback, you want to put yourself in a better position, whether you either get a guy or to move up and get a guy. Um, so I think a loss here certainly helps. Uh, that's that's my take. There's a the prediction. The key to that one, do what they're doing, playing all these young guys. There you go. But I'm going to get to what I'm going to get to in a minute are three things that I want to see is focusing a lot on Sam Howell and then some of the young guys. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but first a couple uh, little news and notes about let's, let's go, let's take a start. A first look at far as far as who is not going to play in this game. So I'm going to read you the list right now and who is out for Sunday. Um, starting with defensive tackle, John Allen, Lyman city, Charles Lyman, Cornelius Lucas, running back, Brian Robinson, uh, defensive end, James Smith Williams and cornerback, Benjamin St. Juiced. Also running back Antonio Gibson was placed on IR on Thursday. He also underwent surgery on his, on his foot to repair a fracture, something he's been dealing with for a while. We, we were told that it was something he could not make worse. So he was able to keep playing, but when he sprained his knee, that that was, that was basically the impetus to just shut it down, take care of this now, get to the off season, start rehabbing, start being able to rehab process earlier. And Ron Rivera said he should be fine for the spring workouts. And then questionable is Cam Curl is questionable linebacker, Jamin Davis linebacker, Nate Gary and guard, Andrew Norwell. I'd be surprised if Curl plays. I don't see any particular reason why he should play. We know what, we know what the guy can do. They know what he can do. He's hugely important to that defense. So, but it just, it, I, the indication is that he's not going to play. So I'd be surprised there. But what we do know, again, as the year closes, the MVP of that back seven is Cam Curl. When he's not out there, makes a tremendous difference. I think the, the, you, I was talking to one player today about him and said that he basically plays almost like seven different spots back there. You have to be super, super smart to do that and then also talented. And not many people have that combination who can do all of that. They do have Jeremy Reeves who comes in, very smart player. It's why he's last in the league. But they, you know, they don't have anybody else who can back up what Cam Curl does. That is going to be something they look for in the offseason, whether in the draft, whether in, in free agency. Somebody who can play that Buffalo nickel spot if Cam Curl is hurt because a trickle-down impact is pretty big. So there you go. Also on Sunday... It's a big game for not just some of these young guys, but I also think for some coaches, I think Scott Turner, I think he's got to have a good game and it's not about watching the points, watching the yards. I think it's about process. How are you, how are you using guys? Are you adhering to what they want you to do, et cetera? So I think, you know, for anybody out there, I don't think anything is decided yet about as far as coaches coming back or not. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch what happens over the next several days and then into next week. Um, but I do think that, you know, you, I think that they, this, some coaches here need to have a good game. That's just, that's what I would say. Anyway, I also think that Sunday is a big game for another reason, because of retiring the Jersey of former Washington, great quarterback, Sonny Jurgensen, hall of famer, also, who was a longtime broadcaster and just a great ambassador for this franchise for many, many years. And I think it's great that they're honoring him. Great that they're retiring his number. I wish they had done this earlier. I wish they had done this several years ago. I think there are a few guys from that veteran group, the alumni who helped build the popularity of this franchise over a few decades, including guys like Daryl Green, you know, the art monks of the world, John Riggins, guys like that. I, I wish, I think they're long, I think they're, they're late, they're tardy and honoring all that group. 
and retiring some of those numbers that are deserved. Anyway, as far as Jurgensen goes, my wish would have been that they had done this earlier in the year. Instead, you have an 88-year-old guy, you're waiting to the last game of the year against the Dallas Cowboys, where you know that they automatically have almost half the crowd. Now it's in a game where it's, it's clearly more meaningful for Dallas. So you're going to increase that discrepancy or that disparity. Um, regardless, I'm glad that they're honoring Jurgensen. Again, it's the right thing to do. Uh, I just wish it had been done a little bit earlier and maybe better weather in, a more, in front of a more favorable, more pro-Washington crowd uh, just because that's what the guy deserves. Still good that they're going to do it. Glad they're doing it. And so um, move on. It was for me on the beat. One of the pleasures of this job was getting to know guys like Jurgensen. And, you know, I had a dad who grew up watching these, watching the Jurgensons and the Sam Huss. And one of the thrills for me was one time when they opened FedEx, they had a gathering at uh, FedEx field. And my dad got to meet Sam Huff. Well, my dad grew up a Browns fan, a big Jim Brown fan and the Brown J Jim Brown, Sam Huff battles were huge. So for him to meet Sam Huff was cool. And Sonny Jurgensen, he met Sonny Jurgensen as well. That was cool. One of the most fun nights that I had on the beat was in my first year. We had back in the day on the road, you'd have to go down, you'd be in the hotel, you go down to the, the public relations staff's room to pick up your credentials for the next day. Now they give it to you on like Thursday or Friday. But back then you'd get it in the hotel room before the night before the game. So we go down the room and the PR guy there, it's Rick Vaughn. We're sitting there talking to him. I'm with Jim Ducebella, Paul Woody, if you long time beat reporters back in the day. Anyway, so we're there and then in comes Billy Kilmer, Sonny Jurgensen, and then a former, I think it's Tom Delaney, who was a former equipment manager back in the early 70s. They came in the room and they just told one story after another for about 40 minutes. And at the end of it, we kind of they they got up and left and we all kind of looked at each other. Should we have applauded? Because it was it was incredible. And the one thing I remember that in some of these stories, it's hard to tell, but what I do remember is when Tommy, this Tommy, I think it's, I don't know, it's Delaney, McVaney, McVeigh, um, I can't remember his last name, but long time people would remember the name. Rick Snyder would remember the name, but he was an equipment manager back in the day, but he was telling these stories and you'd see Billy Kilmer was just laughing at the memories or just smiling at the memories. Sonny, Sonny looked a little bit embarrassed by some of the stories. So I just thought it was kind of interesting, but it was an entertaining night. But I also just, it was cool to get to know Jurgensen on this beat, to be able to talk to him about quarterbacks back in the day, how much he thought that Gus Farratt was better than Heath Schuler, and eventually how he thought Trent Green was the best of that group. He was proven right in all those cases because he's just very smart about that position, obviously. So that was a fun thing for me. Even back in training camp when they were in Frostburg, he'd be sitting under um, in a, under a parking area where it's, you're basically covered and you're watching practice maybe through in his car and you'd walk by there. Maybe you just talk to him for 10, 15, 20 minutes while he's watching practice. He just, that way he's not being disturbed by a lot of autograph seekers or whatever. He can watch practice in peace, but you get to sit there and talk to a guy who's a hall of famer, who's really, really smart. So that was, it was one of the more pleasures, one of the most pleasures uh, biggest pleasures I've had being on this beat is getting to know guys like him, Doug Williams, et cetera. Anyway, just wanted to start with that. Now let's get to three things that I want to see or what I'm looking for in Sunday's game. Let's start with Sam Howell. The first one and two are about Sam Howell. First one, Sam Howell's poise. And I say that because listen, you, you heard the list of guys who aren't going to be there. Brian Robinson, Antonio Gibson, you're not going to have Cornelius Lucas. You're going to be starting Chris Paul at guard. So how is Howell going to react against a really good defense that he's going to face? You're going to have to see, you're going to be put under a lot of pressure. How do you respond? This isn't about, I don't think this is the game where you don't sit there and measure him by points, yards, et cetera. Now, if he goes out and has a great game, by all means, but if he doesn't, what are the other processes that took place? That's how they're that's how they're going to measure him. And I think it's what I'm going to be looking for too. Now, obviously, there's some things it's gonna be hard for me to know, like, well, did he throw to the right guy? Did he do this? How is his footwork? They're gonna know all that. But I'm gonna look at how does he respond to situations? If you throw a pick, how do you come back on the next series? You know, what kind of what kind of confidence are you showing on the field? That kind of thing. I do know that players are kind of excited to see what he can do. They know that he has talent. I've had, you know, he's he's a more talented version of Taylor Heineke. You know who would say that? Taylor Heineke. And, but I do think players are excited to see. And I was talking to one receiver. He's talking about how how well that that 
Howell layers the ball and he throws with really good touch. That's something that has stood out to them during the practices this week and for some over the last several weeks. But that's something that stands out. And then he threw, like one player was telling me, he threw a really nice back shoulder pass on target the other day in practice. Like that's something they haven't seen from the other quarterbacks. So I think that's something they're looking forward to. Accurate touch strong arm and athletic. So I, we, everything we saw in North Carolina from him, and it's why it's at least intriguing to watch this game. Again, has the arm talent, go back and watch the North Carolina tape. Um, you know, the, he's got, he shows some of the quick twitch that they like to see. So there's a lot of reason to be. Now I will say one of the things is he's not a very big quarterback. He's listed as six, one, two twenty. I do think he's got, like I said, a stronger lower body more so than Heineke does, but he's not a super big quarterback either. Um, but how, you know, so that's something to watch, but how does he handle getting hit? How does he handle again? If there's a bad play, um, how again, what how is he processing? What is he seeing? Is he hitting his plant step, getting the ball out? Is he is he is he taking too long, sticking with one read, et cetera? Those are all the things I think that come back to it. But the number one word for me would be the poise. Number two, the number two thing I'm gonna look for with him is footwork. The number one issue with him for the coaches has been his footwork. And you saw it in North Carolina and they saw it during OTAs training camp. And even during the season, it's also, it's a lot about marrying the feet with the concepts of the route. So on some routes, and I've explained this before, and he explained it when I had him on the podcast last month, but you hit a plant step and then is it, you know, some routes, it's one hit throw. Some routes, it's two hits is throw. Sometimes it can change based on the look. You might go into the line thinking one thing, they change the look. So now it becomes something else. Those are all things you have to get used to. And then it's also the, pro then it's like taking the proper footwork to get the proper depth. At Carolina, the coaches thought that he got a little bit lazy with it. And you could see it on film. He has special arm talent. He had special, he's athletic. So he could get away with that in college. It's going to be harder to get away with that consistently in the NFL. One thing he can do is he can throw a little bit off platform and still make some accurate throws. But to win consistently, they want to see the feet marrying the eyes. You know, so if your eyes are looking to the left, they want your feet going with you as often as, they, you know, as much as you can. Sometimes the pocket may not have that choice, but you need to get that, get that squared away to have a consistent, good career. Cause I know like there are some players here who do think that this kid can be pretty good, especially in the future. So, you know, I think that's, that's a big part of it. Will he be taking the right drop? There was a play in the Baltimore preseason game where his drop wasn't at the right depth because of it. He gives up, a, he gets sacked. Now the line gets blamed for that, but it's the quarterback drop that led to the sack because he just didn't get deep enough. So you gave the lineman a better chance to get to you. So will he be, will he be taking the right drops and getting that going? Um, in college, again, special arm talent. So it wasn't always about the feet. The other thing too, this is something that Kurt Warner talked about. And, and this is something you see too. And um, I know the coaches have talked about it, but Kurt Warner talked about it in a breakdown he did of Sam Howell for his uh um, YouTube show. Uh, and a lot of it was about the bounciness in the pocket and how he said, you know, you watch the feed, sometimes it gets a little bit bouncy. And because of that, sometimes you're not able to throw on time and in rhythm because maybe you're on the up bounce and you're not ready to throw. So if a guy's open and you're kind of bouncing, bouncing and you're up, you're not ready to throw. So watch for that. That's a little thing that that he saw too. And I also found it interesting going back and watching Warner's video that he did on this and how he called, he felt like he was one of the most, maybe the most intriguing player of the top five quarterbacks that he had in last year's draft class. He felt that, that Howell might be the most naturally gifted thrower of that group. So there's reason to be intrigued to see where this then goes. I don't think you can, you, I don't think you can change the direction of their decision at quarterback based off one game. In other words, Wentz will be gone. Heineke, they can resign him. I think they'd like to resign him. And it's just a matter of, does he want to be back here or not? But as far as a starter goes, you're still going to go through the process of, can you upgrade? Can you not, et cetera. But I do think if Sam Howell has a good showing, certainly it's going to give them a lot of things to consider moving forward. But in the NFL, it always starts at quarterback with the feet. So pay attention to that. Finally, let's look at, now we're going to get off the 
Sam Howell train for a second. And we're going to go to the young fellas. How are the young fellas going to perform? And by the young fellas, like they're going to play a lot of the young guys. Some of the guys are just guys who haven't played a lot this year, but who really don't factor into the future. There are a handful of guys who do. So let's start with guard Chris Paul, because he factors into the future. They like where he's at. He's an athletic guy. He plays, he plays with power. But the one thing that they that they felt like maybe even during practice, there are a lot of times where it's like he'd be going well or doing well. And then for a few days or a week or so, it was a little bit of a head scratcher. Like, where is he at? You know, he's is his performance kind of drifting a little bit. So that consistency of performance is something they're looking for from him. But but if he can, if he plays well, I think he gives them a reason to maybe check something off their list right away in the offseason. They're still going to look to upgrade on that line. But I think if he plays well and you have Sam Cosme out there, Charles Leno, you have the the base of a, a group that you can have put together for next year. And that's, but again, they're going to look at offensive line in the draft. I mean, whether it's probably a tackle or a guard, depending on what it is, depending on where they put Sam Cosme. But Chris Paul's performance will be something to watch. I'm going to go back to Cosme too, because he's, it's been kind of an odd year for him. And he does, he has that left hand where he had the surgery on his hand um, and the thumb, but he still only has use of three of his fingers on that left hand. So it's only about 70% or so. He's got about five more weeks of therapy. So that's something that um, certainly impacts your performance. The question for him will be, where is he better suited for, guard or tackle? I think in his mind, it's like, give him a spot, let him go, but don't yo-yo. So I think they'll make a decision early in the offseason, then it's going to depend on where do you, what do you do in free agency, what do you do in the draft? Because in the draft, you find a tackle, you, can, you put him to guard. And But I do think that that's strong consideration. And I've told you before, they view the right guard as the most important of the interior positions just because of who you have to face a pass rusher or excuse me, of the guard spots. It's the right guard spot. So if you can get Cosme out there, and I think they see some traits of a brand sheriff in terms of his ability to move in space and some of his tough or strength inside that they really like. So I think one thing that could help this offense next year is an athletic guard, Bram. And I talked about that. Bram was big on that in the offseason, but the athleticism at guard would be a necessary boost for this front. And it's something, again, then you find a tackle, solidify center, whether it's Chase Rouye, Tyler Larson, one of those guys will probably be the starting center, depending on who's the healthiest. And then you get Schweitzer backing them up, but you need to add a couple young guys for that front just to, to get young guys who young guy, younger guys stay healthier. And, and that's that's something they absolutely need. But that's another one. Then I'm going to look at tight end Armani Rogers. Has not played in a long time because he got was on IR. He's ex, I was told he's expected to play Sunday. So he has not been as of when I'm doing this, he has not been activated yet. So I'm assuming that's going to happen and he's going to play, but I think he's a guy that definitely factors in the future as well, along with young, another young tight end called Turner really would like to see what those guys can do as pass catchers, especially Armani, I think has some really good athletic ability. And I do think that his absence hurt them with what they could do in the pass game because of that athleticism. And I also liked how he improved as a blocker. I like how Cole Turner has progressed as a blocker as well. But I'd like to see that group more incorporated into the pass game, creating some different matchup issues down, whether it's Sunday or next year. Get them more involved in the pass game. Get some more two tight end sets where you have a Cole Turner and an Armani Rogers where you can split them out and then attack like that, much like what they did for a little bit when they had Jordan Reed and Vernon Davis. It was a dangerous combination, but they used it. And I don't feel like they've used that enough this year. Cole Turner should have been more involved in the pass game than he has been. And I think that's that's been a detriment to the offense. I think they need to use more of what they have and they do have some good skill town. They have good receivers. They have good tight ends or, or intriguing young tight ends, especially. So I think you need to incorporate that more. So will we see that Sunday? I don't know, but I do think we need to see that down the road and say again, Cole Turner, you can throw him in there as well. And you know, that's, that's there. The other, the other one, Percy Butler at safety, like to see what he can do. Good speed. I think I like what he's done on special teams. Uh, how does he, does he, he'll get more time. How does he respond to that more time? So that's another one there. And that gives you a glimpse of what they maybe can do down the road. The other young guy I'm going to see is Chase Young. 
And I know it's only his third game back. You're not going to see this massive jump from one week to sec week two to week three. But does he get a little bit less tentative with that leg? Because you still you still see the tentativeness in in what he's doing when he's planning, when he's around a pile. Don't blame him around the pile because you don't want to get caught there. But you do still see some of that. So they still want to see more more consistency and just letting go. Chances are we're not going to see that till next year, but does he do anything big to maybe change this game, get the crowd on their side, whatever. But that's one thing I'm looking for and just how he responds with that. This is a big game for some guys and not necessarily Chase Young, because again, he knows that next year is going to be his, where he's going to have to get back to hundred percent, but big game for Chris Paul, because if he can go show something again, it gives him a leg up for next year going into the season, big game for Sam Howell. And the one funny thing is, like, I know I've talked about this. You probably have talked about this among fans. Like, this is a tough offense, to, or, excuse me, tough team to face for your first time. You know who knows that? Sam Howell. You know who's excited about that? Sam Howell. Because I talked about this. Like, yeah, it's a tough one to do. He goes, hey, I'd rather have it this way. That's what you want to see because that's a guy that's – you want a competitor out there. And there, to be honest, there's no easy, really easy team for a rookie quarterback to face – but this is a good one because you get a good test. And, it's, and if you go out there and do well, more power to you. So I think that's something else to look at. Anyway, again, no prediction for this game. Well, I already gave it. Dallas wins. Uh, but that's. But I just wanted to give you three things to watch. So there you go. Going to wrap this thing up on Sunday. I'll be back after the game, wrapping up not just the game, but you know, looking at Sam Howell, but also talking a little bit about the season and then what to expect in the week ahead. I'll be talking about that with Nikki Jabala from the Washington Post. And then on Tuesday, I'll be doing the live stream with Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders, as we also look ahead to the off season and any moves that maybe are made in the first couple of days of the off season. Thank you for joining me all season. I'll be here all off season, so we're not going away, but I do appreciate you tuning in and I'll talk to you next time.